Good morning. I have been traveling to Papua New Guinea, my first overseas trip for the year. Um, I'm doing quite a few in the second half of the year. First half, I was home. So in a couple of weeks, I head to Africa again for, for two Sundays, um, 16 days or so. But Papua New Guinea was wonderful. Went to Rabaul, a volcano territory. And, and I think I sent a, a video. Did anyone see that? Volcano, fire, lava going. No, no, it was actually, it's quite dormant. But um, just where we were, the town is 30 feet below. It's a moonscape. So when uh, Vulcan and uh, Tuvaru blew up, it buried the city of Rabaul. And uh, so they've moved it further down. So I was up there in the Gazelle Peninsula in New Britain Island uh, to... Uh, share at the Pastors and Leaders Conference, CRC Pastors and Leaders, that we had uh, um, quite a few hundred people there. Pastor Barry Silverback and I uh, shared the preaching of the Word, and it was a terrific time. Uh, they devoured my books. I didn't have enough. It nearly killed me carrying them there. Got to find another way, <laughs> like, like it was so hard. But anyway, um, then we went down to Port Moresby and Ben Matson from Alice Springs was with me up in the trip and it was his first experience uh, in Papua New Guinea. He wants to go back and bring his family. Everyone does. And so uh, we had a great time there just teaching in the Bible College and with the church. And then I flew back home on the Friday. I was only there one Sunday. Then went to Hobart last weekend to uh, share with Pastor Norm Reed and the church there. I try and go there once a year. Next Sunday I'm up in the hills. Uh, Christian Family Centre, and then to Africa. So it's, uh, I appreciate your prayers as I'm, as I'm travelling. Um, hey, those young people were fantastic, weren't they? Did you see all those wabnitzes jumping up and down? <laughs> Alex, I want to see you here when you're doing the piano, when your dad is leading. <laughs> so uh, it was great. And... Um, uh, David and Kathy, are you in grief? Have you started the grieving process? Are you crying? Are you upset? David and Kathy's uh, beautiful son, Timothy, is heading to Yale University. When's he actually leave? Friday. Friday. Oh. And uh, Tim uh, has received a PhD scholarship to go to one of the elite universities of the world, Yale, Connecticut and um, to do his, his doctorate. Uh, he's a whiz kid. And pray for David and Kathy. They are grieving. So in three weeks, after he goes there, they'll be going there every month just to visit him. Isn't that right? No, not quite. But uh, Tim has been instrumental in what's happening in our young people. Uh, he serves uh, every Friday night and Sunday morning, loves the kids, and he really, he's been operating as a pastor. In fact, we call him Pastor Tim um, because he's, he just operates in a pastoral capacity. And so I've joked with Tim, I said, I'm expecting the Christian Family Centre Fellowship to start at Yale University, and you can invite me to come and speak, and then you can invite Pastor Adrian and, and Nathan, and uh, so uh, for keeping me in your prayers. What? <laughs> oh, you want Mick to go there too, that'll be an experience. So... Um, so, yeah, so keep uh, uh, Tim in your prayer. So we're going to pray for him, I think, at the 10.30 service. Isn't that right? So um, um, what a joy to read Psalm 119. I went through it again and again this week, reflecting on the psalmist. We don't know who the heck wrote it. I would like to think David did, but usually David's name appears on it. But whoever wrote it, it was a poet extraordinaire. And his or her revelation... We, of the authority and the power of God's Word is like you're reading the New Testament. Somehow, they had such insight and revelation, some of these singers and poets and musicians, of how God works, that it's like you're reading something in the New Testament. Because so often, the Old Testament, um, you, you're trying to understand it to make sense of it, and, uh, but some parts of it are so clear. And so I'm sharing just a few thoughts this morning on truth to stake my life on. Jesus is the Old Testament's focus. Um, if you want to understand the Old Testament, the key to the Old Testament 
is the New Testament. So if you're new in the faith and you want to know where to start reading, start reading the New Testament. You don't start with Genesis or Leviticus or Exodus because I tried that and when I got to Leviticus, I was totally confused. There was so much blood and guts and sacrifices and animals being killed. I'm thinking, what the heck is all this about? And then when about the tabernacle and chapters and chapters and chapters about the fabric and the colours and the structure, I didn't quite get it. And nobody really gets it because the key to the Old Testament is the New Testament. So when you've, you've grasped uh, the New Testament, then the Old Testament makes sense. Because the whole Old Testament really points to Jesus Christ. So you can get bogged down in some of the incidentals and miss out that the whole purpose of from Genesis through to Malachi was that God was, was speaking to us saying, one day I'm going to visit the planet. One day I'm going to come and solve the problem of, of human sin. I'm going to change, I'm going to be able to provide the answer to the human condition, which is uh, independence of God and sinfulness towards, towards one another. And the New Testament fully reveals Jesus. The Old Testament points to him and there's a gradual revelation of, of, of who Jesus is, but it's in prophetic language. So, so the writers oftentimes were thinking, are they talking about their present era or are they talking about a future era? And so, but the New Testament fully reveals Jesus and explains him to the full. So Matthew 5.17 says this, this is Jesus speaking, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. He says everything that's been written in the whole Old Testament, including the Psalm that we're reading, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So he is saying, by my life, through my death, and because of my future resurrection, he goes, I'm going to fulfill every promise every word that's been given through the Old Testament, that salvation will come to human beings, that they can come to know God the Father, that they can experience His love and grace and forgiveness and have a relationship with Him. Have a look at Luke 24. This is two men on the road to Emmaus. These guys are believers. Well, they were believers up until the cross, but then they're confused. They're full of fear. They're, really, there's confusion, fear, doubt, unbelief. And they just think, oh, it's all gone. It's all finished. Like, we thought the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. Jesus explained a few things, but now it's just, we don't know what's going on. And Jesus turns up. The resurrected Christ turns up and walks with them. And they don't even recognize him. And it's a mystery. People, commentators go, you know, I wonder why they didn't recognize him. I think because they weren't looking for him, because they weren't believing that he would rise from the dead. So if you don't believe something, even if the person appears, you're not going to recognize him as Jesus because he's dead. So it must be somebody that's a lookalike. They didn't understand. They just, they weren't expecting it. So, so Jesus asked them a few questions and then he gives them a Bible study as they're walking. And like the Bible study is not like, now let me turn to the scroll of Exodus or the scroll of Isaiah. I mean, they were huge things to carry. There were no printing presses then and there were no little Bibles that we carry around. So the word was already in his heart. The eternal word, as John says, was the Son. And the Son is the author of, of the whole Old Testament. So he knows he knows every book and every chapter. And it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Man, what a Bible study that would have been. That would have been the best Bible study ever, to have Jesus himself go through Genesis to Malachi and point out all the references to himself. Wow. Wow. And these guys are pretty thick, you know, like at the end, they say this to themselves. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And finally, they realized it's Jesus. He's alive. 
It's true what the Old Testament prophesied. Read Psalm 22, read Isaiah 53, two whole chapters that focus on the death and resurrection and ascension and future ministry of Christ. And so Jesus is the Old Testament's focus. And these guys who, who, who write um, the Psalms and other scripture, particularly Psalm 119, some of them had received insight, but they didn't have the complete understanding that it was through Jesus Christ and in this era that we get the full revelation, the full understanding. Let's read some of the wise words from the psalmist about the Bible, about the word, truth that you can stake your life on. These words, Psalm 119 verse 86, God's directives for life they are. All your commands are trustworthy. All of your commands, Lord, he said, are trustworthy. Now, these challenge our obedience. They're God's directives for life. You know, will we or won't we obey? <laughs> and so Psalm 119 is an incredibly powerful chapter saying to us, will you obey him? Will you not obey him? You can obey him because all his commands are trustworthy. They're God's directives for life. They're, they're God's promises for life. Verse 140 of Psalm 119. I just went through it and picked a few of these verses that hit me about the scriptures. Your promises have been thoroughly tested. Wow. Whereas God's directives for life challenge our obedience, will we or won't we? Your promises... These challenge our trust, our trust faculty, our believing capacity. Will we trust his words? His, your promises, he says, have been thoroughly tested because I'm convinced I can trust them. God's promises for life. There may be some directives that he's giving you and you are struggling. You're like, will I or will I not? This is the eternal challenge of the, a Christ follower. Is it my will or his will? And so the psalmist is saying to us here, God has directives for our life. And Psalm 119 is full of them. And, and they're, they're trustworthy, his commands. Am I going to obey them or not obey them? The promises, will I believe them? Will I, will I put my trust in them? It's a bit like a coin. Anyone got a coin here? Got a big 50 cent piece or something? Anyone got a coin? Do you know what coins are? <laughs> they used to exist a few years ago. <laughs> anyway, if you grab it, oh, you got a coin. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, man's got a coin. It's only a little one, though. It's got a head and it's got a tail. You try and take the head off, you destroy the coin. You try and take the tail off, you destroy the coin. I liken this to the coin of faith. What faith is, if you want to know what faith is, it, it's about the directives, the commands, and about the promises. And, and you can't have one or the other. People say, oh, just give me the promises, Bill, just give me the promises, and I'll believe, and, uh, but don't mess with my life about the commands, please. I just ignore those. Just the promises, the promises, the promises. I want blessing, blessing, blessing. I want provision, provision, provision. Oh, that is beautiful. That's the dessert. But don't give me the spinach and the turnips, please. The commands that address my will, my, my heart. Am I going to truly obey him? And the reason why we don't obey him is because we don't think his commands are trustworthy. But it says here, his Look at that scripture again. God's directors for life. All your commands are trustworthy. He's not going to ask you to do something that's, that's not in your best interest anyway. Even though in the short term you might think, man, am I, am I going to miss out on something? Am I going to lose? No, it challenges our self-centeredness, our selfishness, our, the orientation of our life. Is it just for self or is it for God and for others? And so the coin of faith... You can't separate obedience and trust. Thanks, mate. I needed that. <laughs> Just come and see me afterwards and I might give it back to you. It's God's authority for life. Psalm 119, 18. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Wow. 
In John chapter 1, Jesus is introduced as the eternal word. And the word, so, so, so God reveals his son as the creator, the one who was the eternal word and he appeared in human form. But he says, your word, the words of God, God is so trustworthy that they are eternal and they stand firm in the heavens. What God says, he will actually do. They're God's authority for life when you imbibe a word of promise. Look at, look at verse 96, still on the same thing. To all perfection, I see a limit. Because I look around and I see what people say is perfection, but there's limits to that. But your commands are boundless. There's no imperfection. There's no limitation. Your commands, your promises are boundless. They are God's salvation for life. Psalm 119, verse 41. May your unfailing love, I love this, come to me. Lord, your salvation according to your promise. You see, salvation, this guy knew that you can't earn your way to salvation. You can't work your way to heaven. It comes to you because of his unfailing love. This is New Testament revelation. He doesn't name Jesus, but Jesus is the only one who can accomplish this. We can't save ourselves. We can't forgive our own sins. It's only God that can do that. And it's God's freedom for life. Look at this one. Verse 45, I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. The more you seek God's precepts and his, his commands and his promises, you will gain more and more freedom. Maximum freedom flows when the rule of law operates. You think about that. If there wasn't the rule of law in our country, and man, what a country we have. What an amazing country. And we have the basic laws of the land, federal, state, local. Most people adhere to them. And there are hundreds of them. And we kind of know them innately. And if you don't know them, well, if you do something wrong and the cops arrest you, you can't say, well, I didn't know them. You've got to, know, you've got to somehow know that these laws, these precepts are there to maximise our freedom. Um, for example, imagine if there were no road laws. No road laws. You would, you, we wouldn't be here at church. You wouldn't take the risk to get in your car to come here. You have all these crazies doing 100 kilometres down the road, 80 kilometres on the footpath, skittling people, doing burnouts. And, I mean, it would be the freakiest thing, wouldn't it? But we have lots of road laws, don't we? We got any ex-cops here? Oh, I see David. And he used to police the law. He was so helpful to me as a police officer here where we had some difficult situations, didn't we? You did arrest a couple of people sometimes, a couple of times, didn't you? No, I'm just teasing you, David. And, uh, but seriously, if we didn't have these, these laws, we would have no freedom to, to drive. And so um, uh, law is good. It can't save you. The law can't change your heart. Um, but it, uh, it certainly can maximise freedom. I mean, they've done experiments with children in schools. And uh, you put kids in, in say, a five-acre property like this. And you have, the, in the centre, you have the facility. And then the kids can play all around. Well, the kids... If there's no fences on their property, the kids won't stray too far from where they, they meet. But you put a fence right around, the kids are run with just amazing abandon and throw themselves on the fence, even though it might be a freeway and cars are zooming past. They can enjoy the totality of the property, maximise their freedom because they know there's a boundary there. See, God's word is like that. It doesn't limit our freedom, it expands our freedom. It helps us to, to live life to the full and to avoid the pitfalls that can come our way when we ignore. We need God, we need him in our life. We need him. Our society is lost, people are, are confused. There's, there's such trauma that's occurring within our society because people are just doing their own thing thinking I'm trying to find freedom but they're losing their freedom you know a dear friend of mine ended their life um, eight years ago and it just tore us apart young man 
And at that era, there were seven people a day ending their lives in Australia. Seven people a day. Federal governments, state governments have poured in billions of dollars. There's been the Australian of the year was Dr. McGorry, the, the famous psychiatrist, and there was a huge amount of input. Do you know the rate of suicide has gone up to eight a day? Eight a day. And it's going to keep going up. You go to Sri Lanka and it horrifies you that Sri Lanka has the highest suicide rate in the world. And when my wife and I were there last year, and she did a, um, a couple of talks on trauma. And the reason for that is because of the, the shocking civil war that occurred there. And that the whole society was, has been traumatized. So post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, all kinds of, of psychological conditions that are not being dealt with. And uh, it's, it's like unbelievable. So Kath addressed it. And I mean, every pastor, every leader, every man, every woman were in tears. As, uh, as she endeavoured to present practical helps and pointing them to Jesus as the one that can, that can provide help and health. Um, but you know, there's, there's, for all the medicines and all the, the training and the best of, of medical people that we have, nothing can really solve the human heart dilemma. There's a great big void within the human heart. And there's an emptiness and, and a deep loneliness within that only Jesus himself can fill. You know, in the United States, I think it was 50 years ago, if somebody was in trouble, sociologists have done these tests, if somebody was in trouble, say you're in trouble, Adrian or, or, or Dave, you had about five or six people to go to. It could be mum, dad, a brother, a sister, a pastor. It could be a police officer. It could be somebody you could go to and you could unburden to. Do you know in the US now, there's only one person one person that people go to. That's amazing. So in other words, there's more people than ever. There's more things to do, but there's more loneliness. There's more disconnection. And, and through that, uh, there is more disaster. And so you check out the suicide rates in the United States. You check out the number of people dying from, from uh, medication through, through prescription drugs, opioids. It's a crisis. I think it's... Um, at the figure, I think it's over 50,000, 60,000 people a year that overdose on opioids and uh, just medicating themselves. And uh, so there's huge, what is this? What's going on in our world? Same, it's because I think people don't have an answer to the human condition. And only Christ can, can, can deal with the loneliness and the emptiness and the inner quest for meaning and purpose. And that freedom, that salvation comes from him. And the final scripture I want to give you from Psalm, then I want to turn to a couple of New Testament ones here, is look at this one. God's comfort for life. My comfort in my suffering is this. Your promise preserves my life. Oh, wow. How often have I seen this as, as a long-term pastor? And I see that outside of Christ, people so struggle and oftentimes never overcome deep trauma in dealing with the, the hardships and the suffering of life. And my comfort in my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. Isn't that great? These are wonderful statements from the psalmist to say God's word is so powerful, it's authoritative, it's powerful. You, it, it, it's God's truth and you can stake your life on it. Now the New Testament's focus I just want to focus on Jesus a little bit now before we, we conclude in prayer. And pr is, uh, the New Testament clearly tells us Jesus is the revealed one. And so all that I've read from the Old Testament, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So, so God speaks and God spoke through the psalmist. And there's wonderful truth there great wonderful promise but as I said the New Testament's the key to the old the old points to Jesus and the new reveals Jesus and so the, 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 the writer of Hebrews says this but in these last days this is a term that since Christ came we're in the last days until he returns he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. 
the sun is the radiance of God's glory. How's this? And the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Here we go, the word again. He is saying in the Old Testament, God gradually revealed himself. It's a progressive revelation. It's not complete. So something like, <laughs> I was teaching the Bible college students in, in uh, Papua New Guinea, saying, now, if you want to develop an understanding of marriage and uh, Christian morality, I said, we look at King David and King Solomon, don't we, as fine examples of what marriage and how to treat a woman and how to conduct yourself in marital affairs. Yeah, because it's the very word of God, isn't it? Isn't it the very word of God? Go, yeah, it's the very word of God. So they're good models, aren't they? They go, yeah. I go, no, 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 they're terrible models. They're good in other areas, they're bad models. And I'm trying to say to the Papua New Guineans, guys, it is the very word of God, but it must be read in context. They, they violated Genesis 1, 2, and 3, where God said Adam and Eve, okay? It didn't have Julie and Kathy and Laura and, you know, it just said one man, one woman for life. And Jesus reaffirmed that in Matthew 19. So David and Solomon and these other guys, they just backslid on that one. So they're not good role models, so you don't get the full revelation of, ma of what marriage and married life is from some of the stories in the Old Testament. Though in context, it's the very Word of God. Or if you want to develop a, an ethical argument, and we did this at university, on war. Is, when is war evil and when is war right? Huge question philosophers raise. So, uh, so there was a Christian man named Augustine, Back in, uh, he was the Bishop of uh, Hippo, northern, right in, in Libya, Tunisia now, that area, probably Tunisia, in a place called Hippo, a uh, big, big town. And he was one of the greatest thinkers the church had around 400 AD. And even today, what he wrote about just wars is what governments use today to assess whether a war is just or not. Amazing. So he bases it on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He bases it on Paul's writings. He doesn't take Joshua as an example of what a just war is all about. So you read the book of Joshua and Judges and try and find out some, think, well, how do we, hey, they didn't do it really that well. And there's a, it, in context, again, the story is the very word of God, but you don't base an ethical understanding about war and peace using Joshua, the conqueror. No, <laughs> you use the New Testament. And so the Old Testament gradually, progressively reveals the nature and heart and purpose and will of God our Father. It says here in no uncertain terms, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe his creator. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation. King David, Solomon, Joshua, Elijah, all of them, had aspects of understanding of what God was like, but only the Son fully reveals Him. Sustaining all things by His powerful Word. So today, all those promises I read to you in Psalm 119, they have greater effect because now we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of this. We now understand that He actually gave us the Word. And look at this. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of in heaven he says you know what he came and solved the sin problem he died in your place he built a bridge between your sinfulness and God's perfection and that bridge is shaped in, 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 as a cross and you just cannot know God you cannot understand God you cannot experience the full blessing of God's words of truth unless you cling to Jesus because only through him, through the prism of his sacrificial death on a cross, do we really understand what God is like, how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, and how powerful his word is to change our lives. Look what Paul says to Timothy. I love this little bit. You can, you can miss it sometimes because we focus on other aspects of this passage. But he says, Timothy, you know from infancy... You have known the Holy Scriptures, Genesis to Malachi. 
which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He says, boy, all that stuff that you read, what you learned as a kid, they led you to come to Christ. They revealed Christ to you, the only one that could save you. Jesus is the saviour. He's the revealed one. He's the saviour. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus answered in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. I think John uses the word truth about 25 times in his gospel. About truth. Truth is a really big concept in John's gospel. But here, here Jesus himself says, no one can come to God except through me. I am the way. And the early Christians were called people of the way, right up until in Antioch. So you can check it out in the book of Acts. It says the people of the way, people of the way. There's only one way to God. There's only one truth, one absolute truth, Jesus. And, and there's one life. He's the one that not only tells us the truth, and he is the truth, but he is the life giver. And in John, in John 1, 14, 17, I love this. Jesus is the grace giver and the truth teller. The word became flesh. Remember what saying about what John says? The word became flesh, the eternal word, the eternal son and made his dwelling among us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Look at this, full of grace and truth. Interestingly, he doesn't say full of truth, he doesn't put truth first, he puts grace first. Is that just accidental or purposeful? I think it's purposeful. Because verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, truth itself can't save you. It's the grace of God, God's riches at Christ's expense, God's free unmerited favour comes to us to save us, to be able to sustain us, to secure us, to keep us together. You cannot remain a Christian unless you understand grace. If you think, well, I'm saved by grace, now I'm going to live by law. I'm just going to, it's just my Bible reading and my Bible memorization is going to keep me saved. No, no, no. It's the living word, Jesus Christ, that keeps you. The written word reveals him to us so that we will come to him and experience him. It's not a cognitive faith to say, oh, well, propositional, you know, have these five, five, these five points of belief about Jesus. And we sang that song today, I believe. And it's great to have propositional truth and point one, two, three, four, five. There's nothing wrong with that. And we need that as a foundation. But I tell you, what will save your soul? What will heal your mind? What will touch your body? What will transform your heart is a living relationship with the God of all grace who's revealed himself in Jesus Christ. He saves, he heals. His presence and his power makes a difference. Why I keep doing what I'm doing is because I know him. I don't just know about him, I know him. I've experienced him. I talk with him. He talks with me. It's real. A living Christ living within us. He says, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. And I love Peter. The final verse of Peter the final word of Peter, what he actually wrote, he's just before he dies, does his first letter, the second letter, the final verse. He urges everyone, he urges us, he says, but grow, just grow in your knowledge about Jesus. Just keep reading Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and just grow in your understanding of Jesus, the person of history. No, he starts off by saying, grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Notice, our Lord and our Saviour. Experience the grace of Jesus for yourself. Get to know him more and more from the Scriptures, but reach out and experience him. This is the only way, guys, that uh, you can get anchored to ensure that the truth that's in you that's revealed through Jesus, you can stake your life on him who is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's stand together as we pray. Loving Father, we thank you for this amazing psalm, a wonderful psalm. 
Thank you for the great statements of uh, what the psalmist says. Amazing statements. We thank you, Lord, that we see him as having revelation. Such revelation. That the word gives direction for our life. That the word has promises to sustain our life. That the word has authority for our lives. That the word reveals salvation. It comes to us and that freedom can be experienced through your word that's imbibed within us and that you give us comfort. And yet, Lord, we know this is not just theory. This is not just psychology. This is not just memorization of a cold word. But this reveals to us a living word, your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this world, who said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the only saviour of the world, the only one who can save and sustain. He is the grace giver and the truth teller. Lord, help us to continually experience the full life that's now ours because Jesus has risen and he has sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to help us to walk with him and to experience him. And Father, for any of us here who are dry and and a, a little bit uncertain and perhaps we're, we're feasting on the word, but it seems dry to us. I pray, liberate us to experience Jesus, the living water. Jesus, the bread of life. As we drink of him, as we eat of him, that we will be sustained. As we breathe him in through prayer and, and talking and relating and sharing our hearts, I pray, visit us, Lord, with a fresh awareness of your amazing presence and power through Jesus Christ. And help us, Lord, to understand more about him from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, from Acts, from the letters, from the whole Old Testament. Help us to understand more of him. But Lord, we want to experience him in our hearts and lives. We honor you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Just while we're in this attitude of prayer, before we conclude, if you haven't given your life to Christ, you can this morning. If you know that you have an awareness of who Jesus is, but you haven't experienced him as your saviour, you can do it now. He's only a prayer away. If you humble your heart and you honestly say, Lord, I'm I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. I need salvation. I need your presence and power. I need to experience you. You, you can receive him right now. Just where you're standing. Just say, Lord, just pray this prayer between you and your heavenly father. Just say, Lord, I, I come to you now and I receive Jesus as my savior, my Lord. I need to experience him. Help me. For others of you, your Christian life's a bit dry. You know him, you love him, you've experienced him. But he is your anchor. This series is called Anchored for Life. You can stake your life on him who is the truth. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. He gives you his word, but he gives you his presence and power to be able to outwork that word. It's not a do-it-yourself, change my life in my own strength. It's actually yielding to him, taking hold of his words of promise and looking to him to make them come alive in your life. Promises to be believed, commands, directives to be obeyed. Obey him, trust him. He is good, he is great. He will come through for you. Bless your people, Lord. Cover them, protect them from the enemy. And may they grow strong in Jesus Christ, strong and mature, growing, as Peter says, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen.